and welcome to our show Dreams, Passion and Your Hong Kong Story. Every time on this show, we bring before you people from different walks of life who have pursued their passion and found great success in Hong Kong. Today we have with us a very dynamic and a versatile personality. Someone who is regarded for his expertise on real estate in Asia, not just as a professional, but also owner of his own real estate company, which happens to be a conglomerate. Let's meet Ben Cha, CEO, Krovena Group, Asia. Hello, Ben, and welcome to us. Hi, Jaya. Thank you for having me. Ben is the CEO of Krovena Group, Asia. Krovena Group is one of the world's largest privately owned property businesses, owning properties in more than 60 cities of the world. From very early stage in his career, Ben has been into investing and developing property. He was managing director and head at UBS for Greater China Division. And after that, he worked as executive director of his own family business, HKR International, which is very well known for developing Discovery Bay in Hong Kong and also for many notable projects that they have done all across Asia. But more than anything else, Ben is very heavily invested in the contemporary art scene of Hong Kong. He is presently on the board for West Cultural Kowloon District, on Asia Art Archive, M Plus Museum, and is also on the advisory committee of Tycoon Culture and Heart Art Heritage. So let's talk to Ben and find out about all his different passions and interests. So Ben, tell us a little bit about your early career after college and how did you get interested in real estate? Sure. Well, thank you again, Jaya, for having me. Really appreciate the opportunity. Oh, it's our pleasure. Uh, so for me, real estate sort of happened by accident. Okay. I studied uh, political science and economics in university, in college. Um, in particular, I studied the development of special economic zones, SEZs, in China when I was in college. Mm -hmm. uh, was primarily interested in finding job opportunities that might bring me to China okay. or bring an opportunity to do work that was related to China. I see. So when I was a fresh grad, uh -huh. um, applied to many jobs that had that criteria and was hired by uh, Jardine Group, okay. which has management trainee programs for young fresh grads. Okay. And um, myself and a few colleagues were sent off to Beijing. Okay. And at the time, Jardines was considering doing property, investment, property investments in office and residential and hotels. Mm -hmm. So I was part of that group that went to Beijing in the, in the this is the uh, mid-90s. I see. You happen to be one of the very few people who has worked as a professional and also in your own family business. Can you tell us a little bit about the differences that you noticed in the two and how best can one succeed at both? Sure. You know, these days, Jaya, the, there's a lot more convergence mm -hmm. between um, the institutional, professionally managed companies and uh, family managed companies. Okay. So just to give you an example, um, you know, the, the, the family businesses, family enterprises, uh, certainly of those of a certain scale, are becoming a lot more professionalized, a lot more institutionalized. Right. Whereas before, governance or succession planning or you know using modern uh, you know management techniques in fact yeah. just really weren't the norm it right. was just kind of you know employer children or cousins or uncles or aunts and everything and just how to kind of get on with business but I think right. these days it's a more competitive world mm -hmm. um, and families and family enterprises and family businesses are becoming a lot more institution like right. and institutionalized uh -huh. Uh, similarly, um, I think a lot of the corporate world, institutional world, whether you know large multinationals or corporates or more regional or even local corporates, uh, I think they are also adopting some of the sort of culture and 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 aspects of family enterprises. So okay. often a lot more long term uh -huh. uh, oriented, rather than purely focused on the short term. And a lot of family businesses just because by definition and how they, they grow, mm. they start as very local businesses. Okay. They start as businesses that um, certainly have a history in certain communities, right. um, in, in certain cities. Um, they've been in these cities and communities for a long time. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence, uh, because families are in, in these cities and family businesses, they, they have a you know, reputational risk. Right. Uh, they are embedded in the communities. Um, so a lot of corporates these days with ESG, with focus, more focus on sustainability, on communities, and so on, mm -hmm. actually that's 
very similar to what a lot of family businesses and, and enterprises have uh, historically done. So a little bit more convergence. Two, still two very different worlds, right. but more similarities um, certainly than when I was getting started 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago. So, but you know, you worked in um, HKR as executive yes. director, which is yes. your own, you know, family yes. real estate uh, conglomerate, literally. Yes. And then, yes. you know, you're right now the CEO of Grovina yes. Group Asia. So, what skills are you bringing from that, which yeah. is now helping Grovina uh, in all the markets that you cover? Yeah. Well, Jay, probably probably no huge surprises. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I worked in my family business in the, in the property arm mm -hmm. for over a decade okay. um, and had a you know, really great experience and, and you know, at, at the, in later years, obviously, you know, you know, more and more responsibility. Mm -hmm. So the geographic footprint of Grosvenor is not that dissimilar okay. from the geographic footprint of what I was doing both at UBS I see. as well as, um, as HKR, mm -hmm. so investing in Southeast Asia, in, in Japan, in mainland China, in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that, um, you know, the, my, my networks, my relationships, my knowledge of the markets, um, you know, being able to put, to, you know, to, to identify, you know, talent and people and draw from those networks. Um, it wasn't necessarily that dissimilar from if I had worked for a, you know, not a family company. So, right, right. You know, I, I think yeah, probably probably no no huge surprises there. So you are yeah. you're a huge advantage to Grovener, I must say. <laughs> I like to think so. Maybe you could uh, have a word with my boss. <laughs> All right, tell us what opportunities and challenges uh, do you think exist in real estate investing in Asia these days? Yes. And you know, you are an expert in this field. Where do you think? Which of the markets that you are handling with is right now, in your opinion, one of the best places to invest? That's, um, that's a really good question. It, it's a question that I, I get often, and I think people who are in property get that question a lot. One of the questions I always ask mm -hmm. when I'm asked that question okay. is, it really, really depends on what the investor is looking for. Okay. Um, because there is, there's such a diversity of opportunity mm -hmm. that it really depends. So I could, I could easily say, well, you know what? Investing in offices uh, in downtown Shanghai is a really good sector to invest in. Fine. But that would only be most meaningful to a certain type of investor, right? right? Um, the return requirements may not be high enough for mm -hmm. someone who's looking for opportunistic high returns, but um, someone who's more conservative, who is taking a portfolio approach, they may say, you know what, I, I like that story, I like that thesis. So, so I think it really depends on, um, you know, on, on the profile, the risk appetite, the risk profile, right. the type of returns a particular investor is trying to get. You're very invested in the contemporary art ecosystem of Hong yes. Kong. Yes. Tell us a little bit about the different organizations that you are part of and what is your role there? So I've, I've had a long-standing interest in contemporary art. Okay. Um, and did it start very early on in your life? Like, did it start as a early. kid? Yeah, yeah, fairly early. So Can you tell us first a little bit sure, what, sure. what time in your sure. life did it start? S sure. So I, um, I went to boarding school as a, t as a young teenager. Mm -hmm. And by pure coincidence, in my dorm at the time, I had a lot of creatives wow. in my dorm and in, actually in my hall. So I had a, a few artists, a few musicians, um, some who've gone on to be extremely successful. Wow. Um, concert uh, violinist, um, and some painters and, and artists and people who were, um, at a very young age, very talented in fine art, mm -hmm. in visual art. So that was my first exposure to hanging out with artists Art and being okay. with artists and, and having, um, rather than at the time at a, as a young teenager, rather than having my parents or an adult bring me to a museum, which yeah. was very boring. Yes. <laughs> going with friends and going with classmates to, yes. to a museum. To appreciate art. To appreciate art and to appreciate uh, contemporary art. Stuff that was really cutting edge. Okay. Stuff that was prima facie was very strange or unusual. So that was started, uh, that was what sort of started my interest. Mm -mm. And then I've always been someone who is fascinated by ideas, okay. by concepts, like many of us are, right. and I've always been a very visual person. Okay. So um, contemporary art is all about communicating ideas and yeah. concepts yeah. visually. So okay. it's, it's something that's resonated, uh, resonated 
with me for a long, long time. So yes. can you tell us a little bit about what West Kowloon Cultural District M Plus and sure. also Asia Art Archive does and what yes. exactly is your role there? Sure. So my, my role these days with, um, with, with a number of these institutions yeah. is very much at uh, the governance level. Okay. Uh, when I was in university, in addition to studying political science and economics, mm -hmm. I also studied some art history and um, uh, some studio art. But my involvement, which has evolved over time, is mm -hmm. really, generally speaking, been in terms of uh, development of institutions, growing the organization, um, and, and, and really governance. So I'm, I'm often like, if, they, if, if an arts organization wants a business person okay. who's art friendly, right. who likes art, to be to serve on their finance committee, okay. you know I'm probably on that list. I see. I'm absolutely not the person if they need curatorial advice okay. or programming advice okay. or collecting advice. So you are a business person with with knowledge enough knowledge of art. Okay? Yes, yes, that. probably enough knowledge to be dangerous, uh, <laughs> and um, and 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 it you know it builds on itself. Yes. Um, uh, I've I have a you know an, a niche and and an interest and a passion. Right. Uh, I continue to be friends with people who are, you know, curators, people who are involved, um, you know, with, with artists, with, with, with curators, people who are uh, putting on shows, who are creatives in this field. I see. And um, at the same time, I'm able to offer perspective from the business world, from, from perspective in terms of organizations, in terms of um, development, and, and so on. In the case of M+, that's absolutely the case. Mm -hmm. In the case of West Kowloon, mm -hmm. um, funnily enough, my, my experience in the property field has really uh, helped me be able to contribute. How is that? Well, it's, it's, West Kowloon is a massive cultural district. It, right. It's a massive real estate project. Right. Um, now, it's not a real estate project in the traditional sense. Mm -hmm. It's a cultural district. Yeah. There, are, there is uh, already, which opened last year, a, a, Chinese, a classical Chinese theater, Shi Chu that opened uh, with great success last year. The Palace Museum is under construction. Okay. That is the first overseas outpo uh, outpost okay. of the Palace Museum in, uh, in Beijing. Uh, M Plus is a, uh, a contemporary uh, art and visual culture museum, um, which is under construction again, and that will open next year. That is a facility and that is a museum which is of a similar scale to MoMA in New York. So M Plus is, uh, is probably going to be the most significant and important museum in the world wow. in a long time, in a, perhaps possibly in a generation. It is of a scale that is comparable to MoMA in New York. Mm -hmm. The curatorial team is, uh, is drawn from professionals in their field from across the globe, people from major institutions from all over the world okay. who have proven track records, uh, the sponsorship and the funding by the Hong Kong government, who obviously are investing on behalf of the Hong Kong people, right. is absolutely unprecedented. Wow. The building itself is designed by Herzog de Miron. Wow. They are one of the leading architectural practices mm -hmm. in the world today. And the commitment of the Hong Kong government um, to make this work the funding that they have provided to start to build a collection and to deliver this amazing project is is really absolutely first rate, and it it will it will change Hong Kong. It will change Asia. Uh, that's how important and, wow. and incredible it is. My experience with Grosvenor, my experience in property, mm. um, has helped me contribute more in relation to West Kowloon. So mm -hmm. M Plus is one of many several cultural facilities in the entire West Kowloon. Right. The entire district is 40 hectares, will have you know, 25 buildings, over 25 buildings um, when it's completed. But because it's a, it's, it is a development project, right. um, my experience with Grosvenor has been very, very helpful. I'm, I'm one contributor, one of, 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 of a number of con contributors, but certainly uh, I'm one of several people from the property field um, who uh, don't have any commercial interest right. in this particular area. Right. Um, don't have any, you know, uh, potential conflicts of interest in this area. It's not an area that, that Grosvenor is going to go into uh, itself. But we bring these skills, this knowledge, this expertise, this industry knowledge, uh, you know, to the table, and 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 are are trying our best to contribute to the delivery of of an incredible 
district, an that entire sounds, cultural district. That yeah. sounds fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's I, I can't wait fantastic. for it to start. <laughs> yes, well, you can start to see it. Um, some parts are open now. Okay. Okay. Chichu Theater is open now. Yeah. M Plus will open next year. Palace Museum will open probably about three years from now. Wow. Um, so, you know, every year or two, a new facility will we'll open. Opening up. Yes, and it's absolutely stunning. It's in the middle of the city. Amazing, beautiful, inspiring architecture. I can totally right imagine. Here. Well, yes. I, you're on the advisory panel for Tycoon. Yes, and Tycoon I'm is great. Fascinated right, yes. by yes. Tycoon. Tycoon is great. Yeah. Tycoon is phenomenal. So, is there anything more that you guys plan to add to Tycoon? Because we already have that amazing prison turned into yes. so yes. many little yes. cute shops and yes. restaurants. Yes. So, are there any yes. other plans that so you can So, Tycoon is fascinating. Tycoon is um, is a former police station. Mm -hmm. Tycoon was built over a period of. 50 to 60 years. Mm -hmm. So it has architecture from different periods of time, different yes. types of architecture. Yes. As you mentioned, yes. there is, there was a prison. It's yes. now obviously now been decommissioned. Uh, there was a, a police station and so on. And in the middle of this very historical in site in Central, yes. um, there's a contemporary art space. There's yeah. a black box theater. Yes. Um, and uh, obviously there's, there's some retail and food and beverage. Right. So that, that's been a phenomenal project. And you know, is, is absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. I'm co-chair of the Asia Art Archive, and mm -hmm. you know, the art world, or the art ecosystem, as sometimes people like to refer to it, there are lots of different aspects of it. You know, mm -hmm. there, there are artists, galleries, auction houses, institutions, cultural institutions, and so on. There's sort of a much overlooked part of this ecosystem, but it's so critical, and that's really the, the more academic parts. Mm -hmm. So art criticism, art history, research, education, the production and creation of knowledge, the sharing of knowledge, these are all really important parts. Okay. These parts of the art world are not certainly not the most glamorous. Okay. Um, you know, the glamorous part of the art world is definitely, you know, the institutions, museums and galleries, right. uh, definitely the auctions and the auction houses and the fairs and so on. What the Asia Art Archive is, is an archive for contemporary art in Asia. It is a library. Okay. It is a resource center for people who are doing research, mm -hmm. who are perhaps in university and researching a certain period of time in the contemporary art mm -hmm. history mm -hmm. in a, from a certain place in Asia. Mm -hmm. And this is our mission within the archive, is to share this knowledge, to collect it, uh, and to share this knowledge. And it's just so, so important. So I, I did want to just mention the Asia Art Archive. I see. And the fact that institutions like the archive, mm -hmm. which are more academically focused, which are resource, are a library, physical library, as well as a digital library that people mm -hmm. can access online, really play an important role in terms of the health and the growth and the development of the overall art ecosystem. You're such a busy professional at, yes, at Grobna yes. and you know you I know you have three wonderful young kids, you have two dogs. Yes. How do you manage to keep your interest in art alive while doing all your other responsibilities sure, so sure, well? Sure. What keeps you going? Sure. Well, um, you know, it is a fine balancing act. Okay. Um, I don't always get the balance right. Um, but you know the saying, you know, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. Right. right. So uh, I have a lot of commitments. Mm -hmm. um, Anne is hugely patient. Okay. Um, Anne is your wife? Yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, I, you know, I, I do have to balance it. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, I do believe if you, if you want something done, yes. you know, do give it to a busy person. So okay. um, time management is hugely important to me. Um, Family is hugely important to me and is always the priority. Yes. So getting that balance right and making sure that it stays the priority is, is, uh, is something that is just absolutely critical. Um, I have to say also, my employer, so Grosvenor, mm -hmm. is very, very supportive okay. of my uh, commitments in terms of the public service that, that, that we've just do. been talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, it's part of the Grosvenor DNA. Okay. It's very important to the company to be engaged with where it's an investor mm -hmm. to actually be part of the success of cities mm -hmm. where the company invests. So, you know, I, I, I have tremendous support from Grosvenor and, um, you know, if I, as long as I can manage my time uh, appropriately, then, it, then it, all, it all works. So where do you see Hong Kong coming up in art and culture scene in context of entire Asia? Do you think it has the possibility of being the center for art and cultural heritage in Asia? The short answer is yes. Mm -hmm. um, I would, though, 
uh, I think it's important to be very clear and dis to distinguish mm -hmm. within art and culture. So mm -hmm. our art and culture is very, very broad. Hong Kong in terms of contemporary art, contemporary mm -hmm. Asian art in particular, okay. I think absolutely will be the most important city in Asia. Okay. And within the world of contemporary art, mm -hmm. and it's not just art coming from Hong Kong, actually, mm -hmm. Contemporary art coming from Hong Kong is actually only part of the story. There are tremendously exciting things happening in contemporary visual art, mm -hmm. specifically from all over Asia, from all over the world, yeah. but Asia, either Asian diaspora or in Asia, all parts of Asia. And we just happen to have an amazing building, an amazing facility mm -hmm. that can house and show a team that can curate and present and educate and, and share knowledge about exciting work from this part of the world, wow. in a city mm -hmm. which is, in my view, mm -hmm. in a city which is the most international city in yes. Asia. Mm -hmm. it, it, Hong Kong has the largest expatriate population in any other city, compared with any other city. Yes. Um, English, which is the language of the world, yes. is um, widely spoken in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, there, you know, whether it's legal framework, whether it's freedom of the press, whether it's um, connectivity, air travel and, mm -hmm. and, and, and ability for people to come to Hong Kong. Um, the, the fact that the Hong Kong culture is, uh, is very open mm -hmm. to people from all over the world. Hong Kong is simply the most international city in Asia. Mm -hmm. So that makes M plus possible, yes. right? Yes. Um, where in other parts of Asia, from all over the world, may not feel as comfortable, may not feel as welcome, may not be able to navigate the city because the lang the local language is difficult to learn. Absolutely, uh, yes. is English may not be prevalent, mm -hmm. or in some cases, the, the local government censors the art of a certain artist. Yeah. Um, so you know it has so much going for it. So Hong, Hong Kong uh, is is absolutely part of the M plus story, and M plus is will be a, a huge part of, of of the Hong Kong story. So nice to know. Tell yes. us what role has Hong Kong played in your personal life then. I'm, I would say I'm very representative and, and perhaps very typical mm. of, of Hong Kong. So I, I grew up bicultural, mm -hmm. I would say possibly multicultural. Mm -hmm. um, I was educated in the United States. Right. I was educated here in Hong Kong. Yes. I work for a British multinational, yes. which is privately owned by a very historical UK, uh, uh, English, Br British, uh, British family. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked for a Swiss bank. Mm -hmm. I've worked for a local Hong Kong family business. Wow. Um, I've lived and worked in uh, Thailand, in Singapore, in mm -hmm. Japan, in mainland China. So, you know, my story is, you know, I, I have interests, you know, that are that are very global. Yeah, yeah very global. So. Yes. Um, I would say that Hong Kong has given me these opportunities and I, I think are very much part of the Hong Kong DNA. So where do you see yourself in the next 10 years now? You have so many varied sure, interests and sure, you're good in sure. so many different things. Sure. And you're a major contributor to different industries yeah. globally. <laughs> so where does Ben Char see himself in the next 10 years? You know, hopefully doing, moving from strength to strength. Yeah. 10 years from now, my, my, my kids will be teenagers and late teenagers. So that will be kind of instructive in terms of our lives at that point in time. Um, in terms of art, in terms of career, I hope to be doing potentially more, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully deeper, Yes. hopefully better. Okay. So yeah, very simply. Oh. Very nice. Are yeah. you ready for a rapid fire question now? I'll try my best. That's getting yeah. to know Ben's yes. Hong Kong story in a bit more fun way. All right. Ben's most favorite cultural activity in Hong Kong? Well, definitely anything art related, visual art related. Okay. Your most favorite casual and formal dining place in Hong Kong? Formal dining place is probably Cheza. Okay. Casual dining place is probably a, uh, a ramen shop in Happy Valley. What kind of cuisine does Cheza serve? Uh, Cheza serves where is it? fondue. Okay. Uh, it's in the Peninsula Hotel okay. in, in Kowloon. So definitely on the Fine dining. Fondue. And I'm sure your yes. kids love it. They absolutely love it. <laughs> okay. What is the last time you did something for the first time in Hong Kong? Two weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, we went hiking. Okay. In the to see the waterfalls in Tai Mo Shan. <laughs> so your idea of romantic date with your wife in Hong Kong? When we were dating before mm -hmm. we got married, one of our primary activities was actually hiking. Okay. Yes. Wow. Yeah. So does that still remain the same? It does. We have less time. 
our bodies are not what they were, you know, 13 years ago. Okay. But, um, yeah, it's, I think, one of our lifelong passions. Three words that describe Ben's hunk of life. Uh, busy, mm -hmm. fun, and busy. <laughs> okay. What are you most proud of as a Hong Konger? Depends on what you mean by that question. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm most proud of my, my family. Mm -hmm. um, in terms, but, you know, and, and we are Hong Kongers. Yes. So in terms of career or my involvement in the arts and so on, it's, it's always the people. You know, I'm very proud of the people that, I'm, that I have the privilege to work with, mm -hmm. that I have the privilege of being affiliated with, mm -hmm. um, the, people I, uh, the people I serve, uh, the people that, um, that I have the privilege of working with. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What would you tell the global business leaders, the policy makers? Why should they invest with Hong Kong? Well, as we were talking about, Hong Kong is the most international city mm -hmm. in Asia mm -hmm. and is a, an important place, mm -hmm. will continue to be an important place, will we'll become more and more dynamic mm -hmm. as, uh, as time passes. How would you invite the 7 billion people of the world? Why should they come and visit Hong Kong? Well, M Plus Museum is opening in, uh, in about a year, okay. and I would invite them to come attend the opening. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would invite them to come visit the library at the Asia Art Archive. Okay. Uh, I would invite them to come visit anywhere in Hong Kong. Well, thank you so much, Ben, for being with us today, and we wish you all the very best in all your endeavors. Thank you, Jay. It was a privilege and pleasure to be here. Stay tuned for our next episode on dreams, passion, and your Hong Kong story where we bring you yet another fascinating story from this wonderful place, Hong Kong.